you know, there's, and again, another saying, but there's only so much we know. There's only so much we don't know. And yep. there's a whole world we don't know that we don't know. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, when we're taking our, you know, electives around kind of 14, 15, and we're picking subjects and topics, we're already thinking at that point about, you know, university and what we might want to do. Mm -hmm. But we're working with such a limited amount of information and we're often working with the information that's surrounding us, so what our parents do, our aunties, uncles, if we've got older brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is where people can get kind of trapped in the wrong career paths mm -hmm. or not really reach their potential because there's things out there that they just don't know that they don't know. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I did this. So yep. it's go kind on, of being able to share this. Um, me and my brother actually both suffer dyslexia. So at school, um, you know, back in the day, that was seen as, you know, you're not very clever because pen to paper we perhaps weren't, but it doesn't mean in here, you know, we're, we're not very clever. So again, you put in these boxes mm. of this is, this is all you can do. And so we're often limited by, you know, and I, again, another saying I have a... <laughs> um, our careers are limited by what we let ourselves believe is possible. Mm. Now, often those limiting beliefs have come from teachers and from parents. Yep, unfortunately. Yes. And <laughs> the one closer to us. Right? <laughs> yeah. So at an early age of 10, 11, 12, you know, if we're being told we're not good enough, mm. And maybe we're just not good in that subject. Maybe the education system just didn't work for us or mm. whatever. We're then going down a career path that's potentially not right for us and we could do much better. Mm. And it goes back to, you know, really helping people be the best versions of themselves. Mm. You know, when we can actually question some of these things, question our career path, maybe we're in a job and I've worked with some people that are amazing, you know, guys, senior in investment banks on paper look amazing but they are so unhappy mm. because it's not aligned with who they are but they did it because their parents their dad did it wow so listening to podcasts okay reading uh -huh. books articles you know uh, studies whatever comes my way uh -huh. because it's it's a necessity and it's crazy because since I've become a business owner, mm -hmm. when you are a business owner, you have to stay in touch with the latest trends. When I say the latest trends, no, you have to stay in touch with the future trends, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to every day eat, I would say, information, right? Whatever it is, mm -hmm. but from podcast, audio. Um, or watching videos or reading books because otherwise you're out of touch mm. for the clients. Yep. And also, I believe part of my work is to to bring some innovation, innovative tools and ideas as well to my clients. Okay, mm. and I've I've come to realize how much information I had missed when I was running operations before as an employee, when I had no time because I was stuck in meetings back to back and I was stuck traveling all the time and you know doing my operational work all the time, never took the time to spend so much time reading and nourishing my, my brain and my, my soul with mm. that content, mm. which is a huge mistake yep. because now I'm learning so many things, so many things. So just setting some time apart Ideally, daily, you know, when it and when it becomes a routine, you don't even think about it. It's just you, you just do it. You know, you mm. subscribe to, especially today, it's so easy. You subscribe to newsletter newsletters, right? Uh, that you actually like, you find useful. You just um, screen through it and see what's interesting, what's relevant, and you. you it doesn't mean that we have to. I, I don't actually highlight everything I read, right? Mm. It's just screening through things and especially when it comes, uh, because it's about my, you know, stuff about my expertise or, you know, I expand also by reading and listening to um, other article and content from marketing and comms and HR because also as a business owner, I also have to feed myself with uh, not only expert content, but also business content, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it just comes naturally. It's part of the daily routine, basically, to expand my thinking and my my way of seeing things. Right? Mm. Um, it's absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. Otherwise, I'm first of all, I'm, I'm super bored if I don't do this. <laughs> but also, I think um, my business is not going to last long if I'm not able to 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 bring new ideas like this on a regular basis. Yep. Uh, well, I think there's a few things. Um, I I try to do the write my writing in the morning, so mm. I try to have at least two three hours in the morning without pause where I can focus on writing. Okay. I I try to talk to people later in the day, mm. so after three p.m. ideally, after four p.m. if I can pull it off, mm. um, and then um, every evening. So every morning also I do yoga mm. and every evening I walk and, and I'm in I'm in New York City right now, but a lot of the time I'm in the countryside. And so for an hour a day I go and walk in the trees and uh, I don't have my phone and there's beautiful birds and animals and I even if I've been stuck all day, I will often go for a walk in the evening and then I will have good ideas. Mm. So I, I, I think my conclusion is it's not necessarily all about the time putting 12 hours a day at the computer or 12 hours a day of reading or it's not necessarily about the time you put in mm. I think you need to manage your energy and I think it's very important to have some time in nature and time to think wow. I think that phrase has to do with the fact that for so many of us, we hold back on the things that we are passionate about mm. or um, the things that we're afraid of, uh, we're, we're afraid of failure, and so we don't bring our whole selves to the table mm. or we don't explore those parts of ourselves that are scary. Um, we don't take the time to really fully ask ourselves if we are uh, contributing everything that um, we're sort of built to do um, and so for me showing up is uh, is taking a step back to look at who you are and what you're gifted at and what your passions are and make sure that you are living fully into all of those things mm -hmm. that you're not allowing fear to hold you back or um, yeah, just your imposter syndrome is another big one that, you know, can cause people to not live into um, who, you know, however you want to define it, who they've been created to be, who they are destined to be, you know, whatever terminology people resonate with. Um, I think for the most part, people have this in a desire to, um, to contribute, mm -hmm. whether that's in the world at large, whether that's in their workplace, um, even just whether they have creative passions or hobbies, music or art or any of those things, um, we have a hard time sometimes um, taking up space mm. in the room. Mm. We're afraid to take up space. Um, we're afraid to to be fully who we are, and uh, so it's part of my mission in coaching to help people to fully show up. Mm. And I think of coaching as just a really sort of a sacred space where like it, it's just like a quiet sort of space where you can really enter into um, reserved time to really examine those things about who you are and what's holding you back. Um, it's it's less I think people envision coaching as you know going to somebody for some sort of like expert advice or like you think of like a sports coach that's there to like sort of tell you what to do or cheer you on and there's definitely cheering involved in it for sure but like I think the greatest gift that comes from coaching is literally just the time that you reserve on your calendar to examine those things and and to follow your thoughts that might come fleeting through your mind all the way through to the end. Like, why am I afraid of that? I know I'm afraid of that. I don't want to be afraid of that. But 
I don't really know how to deal with that, so I just move on. Like, we have those kinds of thoughts that come into our head all the time. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do that someday. I don't really know how to do that. The thought goes away. But coaching creates, like, a designated time and space to say, like, those things are important for me to investigate, mm -hmm. and I can spend 30 minutes or I can spend an hour really examining why I'm doing something or why I'm not doing something um, and ensure that like I'm moving forward in a way that I can be proud of. I hope I can help with this. That's a very interesting question. I, because it's, it's unconscious. <laughs> yes. So that is really interesting. I would share one thing that occurred to me while you were talking is that if something scares me, I pay more attention to it and I usually do it anyway and I challenge myself to do it anyway. Mm. And for example, public speaking was is not a natural thing to do, most people would tell you. Um, and so I made myself do it starting, I don't know, 25 years ago, you know, when I was starting out, I would volunteer and I would just say, just get up there, just get up there, you know, and, and it wasn't easy. And I'm sure I was terrible the first few times. <laughs> um, but you know, you get better and you ask for feedback, whether it, it, you, you fight your instinct not to want to hear it. And and you look at people who are great and you're like, oh, what are they doing? Like, what's so good about what they're doing right now? And then you get better and you're like, oh, and just pick one thing. Like maybe it's their eye contact. Maybe it's how they're holding their body. Maybe it's, you know, their topic or maybe they're a little bit funnier. They smile more or they, you know, um, so you can learn so much from so many different people. So th that's one thing. It's just um, I think it keeps life exciting and it means you're learning if you're if you go towards things that are healthy, but that, 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 that are, that give you a little bit of, of, um, like, Oh, I don't know if I can do that, uh, but that keeps, that keeps you young. And I think it keeps you learning. And then you can always end asking for help from people who, who are better than you. That's a great way to learn. Um, and people love being asked. It's very flattering. You know, it's, it's a very nice thing to do actually for someone is to, to say you do this so well I'd really like to get better at that can how do you do it you know and that that's a fun way to to bond and to to learn so those are some things that I do you know um it's first getting my mo myself my moment of quiet and 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 scheduling it because it is hard, you know, with the busyness of our life. But process my thinking, I first think about, okay, what did I have planned? Mm. What was what was in my plan? Mm. And what did I actually do? Mm. You know, from that. Mm. But I so so I, I look at that first to give myself a sense and a real honest look of, you know, Am I getting closer to what I want to achieve? Mm -hmm. um, and then I look beyond me and, I, and, I, and, and to think and say, what am I seeing in others mm -hmm. or seeing in the organization I'm in or the organizations I support mm -hmm. that I need to be, you know, adjusting, you know, what I need to do, the services I offer. Mm -hmm how I guide others. Mm. Um, I put myself in the place of the people I serve. And so I think about what it is that they're dealing with mm. and what is most important in their mind. Mm. And, and I just, and I process that in a way to say, how does this change mm. what I'm going to be set up to do now? Mm. Wow. Um, and so I, I look inward. Yeah, I start there because I just need to get that out. That's me. Uh -huh. I just, you know, like I said, what did I set out to do and how, how did I get, you know, how did, how I progress in that way? Mm -hmm. But then I focus on the people I serve. Mm -hmm. What are they set out to do? And, and how am I helping them achieve it? Mm -hmm. Am I focused on the right things? So 
So there's the two components is the way I process inward, outward thinking mm. to then give me the sense of, I then go back to what I envision for myself. Mm. Um, yeah, I'll look at strategy, I'll look at plans, certainly, but am I doing what is the in the interest of what I envision? Mm. Well, that's right. We are all leaders and we are leaders of self first. If we can lead, be kind to ourselves mm. uh, and, and, you know, understand our value and how we have to look after our, our work-life balance, our stress levels, um, how we have to have good fitness and good nutrition, but we also have to be whole in our mind, body, spirit, you know. And, and if we recognize the need, our needs for that, we should also recognize the needs of these things and others. And where there's a deficit, where people are, you know, depressed or stressed or un unresponsive in conversations, we have to bring in all sorts of different skills. Uh, you know, the true leader is not about being the leader. The true leader is about looking for clues that the, pe the people that are working with them, how they're feeling, uh, is there a reason they're not performing so well? Um, and, and instead of giving negative feedback, giving, you know, like a coaching conversation where they go, hey, I noticed you don't seem you're the same as normal uh, lately. Is there something going on at home? Is there something you would like to share with me? Asking open questions, genuinely interested. And if they don't respond to that, you know, I heard a really good story this week of a guy who, who's got two employees, they've both got depression. So he, he uh, took off the uniform and he, he met the guy on the weekend and he said, look, just between two, two, two guys, two mates, uh, forget about the work. I just want to know what's going on with you because you, uh, you know, it's hard to, hard to have a conversation at work. And he found out the guy was struggling with depression. So now that he knows that, he can, he's getting him support. And he's given him a bit more flexibility. Um, and he's, he's made sure he's going to a doctor and getting uh, employment, employee assistance program counselling. You know, like if we can be empathetic and caring about those around us, instead of just judging their performance and going, it's not good enough, out you go, I'm going to get someone better than you. You know, that's a, that's a revolving door. If you just keep saying, oh, this person's not good enough, get another one. Well, this person's not good enough still. I don't understand. Why are these people not good enough for my standards? You know, and it's because too many people beat their chest and go uh, of their own ego. And they go, you've got, to, you've got to win my trust. Instead, it should be the other way around. I will trust you unconditionally until I cannot trust you anymore. That's a good question, isn't it? Let me just ponder that for a moment. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm going to be cheeky and I'm going to pull from two. So I think it's, you know, if I could only pick one, I'd say it's being the coach, yeah. being the coach. But again, if I was going to zero down a little bit more into detail, I'd say it's the presence and connecting. You know, when 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 you when your leader meets with you do you feel seen like do you feel seen and heard for the whole person that you are mm -hmm. like not just you know, oh you're the project manager or you're the you know technical expert on xyz are you seen as all of what you bring you know and beyond work like you know you you obviously you have a family and connections and interests and are you fully seen and if if your leader is not present to you none of the other good stuff can happen <laughs> so i think it's it's about connecting being present seeing the person and and also as you said imagining what they can be even if they can't see it yet they can't see um it. and then guiding nurturing supporting challenging Mm. encouraging them to become their best so i've managed to sneak a few extra ones in there too but yeah it's the coaching and connecting i think that that's the it's the gateway um 
You know, Barack Obama said reading is a gateway skill. Like, you know, reading opens the door to all of these other things, you know, you're learning. And I think for me, the coaching and presence opens the door to all the other leadership aspects. You know, mm. if you if you don't connect and you don't coach, the rest is just not going to be that good. Yeah, that's an interesting interesting point. You know, first of all, I think it's uh, for me it's about getting out of the silo, you know, it's very easy for us just to be doing what we're doing in our um, area of expertise, right? So, um, you know, for me, it was technology and analytics. You know, I mentioned that um, I, you know, I was a linguist and I was um, a cultural anthropologist and then I learned business because to me, business is cultural anthropology. At least that's how I approached it. And then the, the, I dabbled a little bit in neuroscience, et cetera, et cetera. And then I reached a point where I realized that I really need to understand technology. I really need to be um, following how the transformation occurs. And uh, so it's be really constant learning and pushing yourself into the next, uh, feel that you know it fascinates you and, and drives the uh, progress because I do think that technology is very very powerful um, and what what is really interesting and maybe unusual to hear for you and um, you know some of the some of the majority of people in the world people think of technology as you know you have to be an engineer you know you have to be an engineer. This is the way to understand technology. And that's how you're going to learn to code. You're going to... I personally don't think so. I think that clearly you have to have some, you know, technical skills. But to me, for example, computer languages are language. Mm. You know, I keep coming back to language, right? It's actually what, from the, from the neuroscience perspective, the parts of brain involved in learning computer languages are similar to language and not not math mm -hmm. um, in terms of how these elements connect. So I really think that technology for me and even analytics from the point of view of massive amounts of data that we are now able to generate, but then building and understanding the patterns that you see through the information presented through data to your point in the very beginning of this podcast it's about stories mm. you know really what matters all of re all of the technology and analytics that may be so daunting to the majority of people at the end of the day come back to our humanity mm. Why are we doing it? Can we tell stories that are going to be impactful and are going to move a lot of people in the right direction, right? And even, even you know, if you are, you know, a, an engineer, et cetera, that's, that's really admirable. But I think you're limited in what you can see through the skills that you may bring to the same coding, and data analysis as uh, somebody like myself with, you know, linguistics and um, cultural anthropology and other types of skill sets, right? Mm. So wh what's fascinating to me is that I think we are coming the full circle to this next level of innovation. And my, you know, and my recommendation to people who want to be current, who want to be challenging themselves, and grow is always looking at is always look at what's in the frontier mm -hmm. what's driving innovation and being able to connect it to what you already know mm -hmm. i don't think that that there are things that become just entirely obsolescent right entirely irrelevant 
we kind of historically transition. I'm an evolutionarist, right? I, as I like to look at the languages in connections to the, the world of business, to technology, to data, to everything we're doing now. And, you know, if you think about, you know, for example, I've spent a lot of time recently looking at the metaverse, you know, mm. VR, AR, and those types of technologies that are coming in. You know, these are very, you know, these are technologies that are really relying on a lot of imagination, right? They, you know, it's almost like myth making. If you think of the history of humanity, we started out creating myths, creating alternatives, creating, you know, our gods and everything. And I think we're coming there through technology back to the same place. So it's absolutely fascinating to me. And so it's kind of an expanding universe. You start out with something you can understand and master and learn the skills. And then, and then it grows like a snowball effect. And if you can continue to be looking out of what's next, picking it up, connecting into what you're doing, um, it may, you will be very, very valuable to, you know, society at large, like myself being in education now, I love, you know, doing what I'm doing mm. and teaching students, my students, um, to make sense mm. of their reality and not just learn the latest trick and sell their skills to the whoever the employee is without understanding of what it means and how to make decisions. So breath is a really important word to me. When I was at a really low point in my life, I actually looked over on the wall and I saw a poem and it had the word breath in it. And I thought you could take everything from me, but you can't take my breath. That's mine. And I actually got it tattooed on me. That was in 2015. So fast forward to 2020, where I'm figuring out who I am and my truth and what I'm supposed to be doing in this life. And I'm working with someone who I no longer work with, but we did a lot of work together and we are like, that word needs to be an acronym. So we think of breath as an acronym. B is for begin where you are. R is reclaim your power. E is excavate core values. A is allow, T is through, and H is heal. And it takes you, we created a six month curriculum to take people from their begin all the way to their healing spot where they can sort of come into their wholeness, their personal freedom aligned with their core values and who they really are and their authentic selves and therefore make more impact as leaders. Excavating core values, I think is super, they're all really, really important, but excavating core values is really, um, that's the one that I'll probably point out to you is because most people don't really know the core values that they're based on, that they live their life based on. Some people don't even have any idea what that means. And I didn't, I didn't. And I remember looking through a long list of core values and thinking, you know, this one, that one, okay, but freedom, why would anybody pick freedom? What does that even mean? Mm -hmm. I remember thinking that like, laughing like what does that even mean and then I realized after excavating and doing a deep dive into myself that freedom is my overarching core value it's the one that's threaded throughout all of the other ones mm -hmm. so my core values and my company's core values are love freedom perseverance trust and truth mm -hmm. but freedom is the one that's threaded and woven throughout all of the other ones if I don't have my freedom to be me authentically me then I don't have anything so that's what I help people do, uncover what their values are, what they're basing their life on, and therefore who they really are. Figuring out who these people, these professionals really are. They're not just their title. They're not just a mom or a dad. They're not just anything. There are a lot of different things. And people just don't realize how much makes them up and what, and what, they're, what values they're basing their life on. And when you can figure out your values and align with them, you can do it. Because then you're walking around and you're authentically you. Yes, I I will answer you. I'm looking for my um, friendship chapter. So, uh, <laughs> and I don't know if you can see that, but yeah, yeah. 
So Chip Conley, uh, actually, in my book, he's in the well-being section, even though he talks about um, the social uh, fabric of our life. Um, but he talks about, when you talked about the quality, I thought I wanted to quote, quote him because he says, we want people in our lives we can grow old with, grow young with, and ideally just grow with. And he says... Um, a stagnant friendship is sort of like a stagnant pond. It smells and nothing lives there. So our friendship for it to grow, it has to evolve as our life evolves. And so I, I like to make things tangible, right? Okay, so how do you evolve a friendship? One of the best ways is to help each other. Um, and this again helps us have a sense of purpose but um, one of my dearest friends a couple years ago uh, called me up and said Aisha um, I'm not feeling well I need help could you come and stay with me for a couple of days and she mm -hmm. literally asked for help and there's a vulnerability in asking for help right um, but as soon as she called me I thought I am a true friend to her. Otherwise, she wouldn't have asked for help. Like, it suddenly made our friendship go to the next level. And I've, I've told her since that, that I'm so grateful to her for asking me for help because it made me feel, oh my God, like she knows she can depend on me. And so that sense of helping each other is so interesting because... You think you're helping the other person, but in fact, the person that gets the most help is you because helping somebody else gives you a sense of purpose and meaning to your life. And that, that's just beautiful. So that's even more beneficial than what you're giving to the other person. So in short, <laughs> for, for that friendship to continue and to deepen, um, collaboration needs to happen and that's I call helping each other collaboration um, and it's great that we, we are not alone and we can help each other and complete each other I think I first had to see that analyzation wasn't insight. Mm. Anal analyzing and ruminating wasn't aha moments mm. and um, out of the blue ideas. That those moments came from somewhere else. Mm. Now, my analytical brain, my intellectual thinking, I love that part of me and, I, I, and, it, and it's valuable for all leaders and for all of us as human beings. But we have a whole nother resource available to us that I don't know we've thought much about. Mm -hmm. And that resource is that kind of inner well of being, that essence where those out of the blue ideas come where we can be driving and, and you know have a fresh idea come to us that we're all excited about. And so when I saw that shifts of consciousness, shifts of understanding, new insight isn't it's a it's a vertical lane, right? It's kind of it's something changing inside. And then there's all my data compiling and my analyzation and my looking and observing, and that's more horizontal. See, I somehow thought that if I had it enough, if I thought about it enough, somehow it would lead to something. Mm -hmm. And I realized like, oh yeah, no, no, it's a different channel. And, and then how do we access that channel is what you and I have said, mm -hmm. freer, more spacious, so what am I doing to take things off my mind? What am I doing to come more into the present moment? What am I doing to create space in my day and my schedule and my life? Mm. Because 
there is a relationship between that spaciousness and the quality ideas we get and the quality thinking. And so that, that do I know the difference inside of me? And once I started to get my own nuanced feeling of, oh yeah, there's, there's this deeper channel, this like other channel with high, with creative thinking and well being and more perspective. And then there's my mind which has a ton of good data and information and analysis and rumination. But if I had to, if like this is impossible, right? But I would say prior to getting more curious about where creativity comes from, mm. where, where new ideas and connection lives in us, mm. I was living my life here. Mm. I was living my life in the intellectual and the processing and the analyst, and I loved it. It was fun and interesting and fascinating. Mm. But when I started to open myself up to this other place in us mm. that has kind of different quality of life and feeling and thinking, that's when my ideas, my well-being, my ability to connect to people in a more impactful way, that was the game changer. Mm. Not getting better this. Mm. Sometimes I say to an audience, or we do a lot of training in all of this, you know, we try in the training to say, um, keep a list of all your employees and fill it in with questions you could ask them to give you more insight into who they are. So, like, one thing I noticed about you is you come from curiosity. You know, your questions are good, and I might say, were you always like that? You know, I want to compliment you on your curiosity. And I'd love to know where that comes from and what you're most curious about. And even if we had three minutes for that conversation, you will feel good. I noticed something about you and I asked you a question about it. And you might not have the answer. You might say, I don't know where I learned to be curious, but you will go home and sleep on it. And you'll think about it. And that's a great conversation and you'll go home and tell your spouse my boss asked me a good question today and etc so maybe it's that easy and maybe I maybe I have to say this more in my own work have you asked your employees a good question about themselves every day have you asked your spouse a question about themselves every day mm. you know and when we ask our kids how was school that's a boring question oh it was good but if we say what one thing happened in school that made you turn off or what's one thing that happened in school that made you light up? There's something you can do something about. Probably the number one thing is relationships. Relationship. relationship building as I said before I, every promotion every new job mm. came with uh, came from a referral mm. so um, that's the key um, creating uh, visibility for yourself mm. um, which is you know you could say is advocating for yourself but creating um, a visibility plan mm. so that you don't 
um, pe you're on people's radar mm -hmm. at all times. Um, so whatever that looks like, you know, in your organization, you, you know, figure that out. Um, and I think the last one is paying attention. Paying attention. What is that? I'm curious. Paying attention. Paying attention means um, what's going on around you. Uh. You know, how are decisions made that influence you? Um, you know, we don't build a career in a vacuum. Uh. And so it's really important to understand the dynamics mm. and what what is influencing those decisions. Um, you know, whether you're in a corporate arena or you're you have your own business, mm. it's important not to stay so focused on your work that you don't see what's going on around you. On the other hand, you don't want to be so focused on what everybody else is doing. And not focus on the words. <laughs> and you're paralyzed, right. <laughs>you never stop thinking but mm. you have to be careful that your thinking is is a healthy thinking mm. and it's growth as well because mm. there's so many people in our world overthinking at mm. the moment mm. and i do call them fleeting thoughts mm. so there, there's so many people with thoughts that just run round and round and round and round again on them and they can't get their minds to stop i mm. used to have that mm. many years ago i was in roles that were probably quite pressurized um, in sales and I remember having that overthinking um, and I had to learn tools and techniques to be able to stop that happening because that's not healthy for your mind or your body mm. nor is it productive because mm. you're using the energy to do all that overthinking mm. which means you've got less energy to do the actions or the clear strategic thinking uh, that you need to be doing to find uh, solutions so and, and to your point about People have so many distractions in their world right now and that they're thinking less. Never has there been more material available to them mm. around tools and techniques to teach them how to healthy think and, and work those minds in a way that, that you know they can change their lives. Mm. But what I see is we've all the information available, it's all on our phones. Most people are not using their phones to learn. Mm. They're using their phones to distract them. Ah. And therefore, you know, what we're, we're creating and what you see then in the world is this mass of anxiety. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's lack of belief in themselves, I see as a massive, I think that's a pandemic on its own. Yeah. And I think it's growing. So uh, the more I see, particularly teenagers, but also in adults as well, I think society is teaching people to self-load mm. and critique themselves and each other far too much. If you want to figure out how to make a human happy mm. and at its most productive, mm. that's not the way you train them. Mm. If you want a human to be happy and at its most productive and, and doing amazing things, then you teach it to love itself and to know self-worth, self-esteem, self-value, confidence, mm. right? But society doesn't really support that because mm. so many people have been taught be humble don't be arrogant um, and you've heard things like particularly at this side of the world it would be a lot of who does she think she is mm. it would be a lot of uh, she's too big for her boots it would be a lot of terminology used around wealth and abundance mm. that that frames it as something bad mm. now, i'm not saying greed is healthy but abundance is healthy yep. in relationships in your finances, in your life. Mm. Yet, that is not the way most, you know, are taught in society. It's very much like play down your unique talents, fit in, be compliant, fit in the box, <laughs> um, do what everybody else does. And I, I think there's a whole piece there around, you know, we are encouraging humans to be sheep and humans don't work best when they're sheep. Humans work best when they're learning and their neurons are fired up when they like themselves, mm. when they appreciate who they are and know their values. That's when you get a human at their best. Wow. Sure, sure. So I consume so much audio content. Oh. 
I, and this is my process. So I read a physical book most mornings. Mm. I have a routine in the morning where I am always working my way through some typically nonfiction. Mm. I, I, I read fiction on vacation and trips and travel, mm. and I read nonfiction for personal development mm. uh, when I, um, just during the regular work week. Mm. And so I, will re be reading a book at any given point in time. I'm, I'm not really a read five books at one kind, one person, uh, at one time kind of person. I, I do one at a time, just go straight through, um, assuming I like it and I finish it. Mm. So I do a book at a time that way. And then I have a one hour walk every day. Mm. So because I sit and teach and stand and teach so much, I do a lot of sitting and, and in order to stay healthy and to have good habits coming out of COVID, I realized I've got to get out of the house and, um, and really take care, take care of my body so that my body and my mind are well and last a long time. So I have an hour walk every morning and not every morning. Sometimes I have quiet white space and I just let my mind wander. But a lot of times I use that to listen to uh, videos and podcasts. Mm. And this is what happens to me every time i listen to a video or podcast i'm not exaggerating every time i'm, I'm like 80 percent listening to what the speaker is saying as mm. i'm walking and then 20 percent of my mind is to try to apply what they're saying uh. so an example an example might be if it's a marketing podcast and they're talking about launching a digital course mm. well even if i'm not about to launch a digital course i'm thinking about the process of their funnel or i'm thinking about how they answer people's questions, or I'm thinking about the secrets they, they share, mm. um, how, you know, what worked, and I'm applying it to something I have coming up. Mm. And invariably, I have to stop, pause it, and then my staff all works remotely. We're in four different states mm. um, in the US. So I have to jump on my voicemail app, and I talk to my phone, and I say, okay, team, here's what I want to do. <laughs> and I get, get the message out there to the, to the staff and we talk about it later but it's basically a placeholder for me to say don't let me forget to come back and tell you about this thing mm -hmm. and so that that's how i stay curious and how i learn and i have podcasts i listen to all the major sales podcasts um i shouldn't say all there's a lot out there but i listen to many mm -hmm. of the major sales podcasts but i listen to so many other kinds of podcasts too and mm -hmm. that's the other thing i would encourage for your listener is that like one of my favorites is called um I've really been on a kick lately for Creative Conversations, mm. which is put out by Fast Company. Mm. And they interview poets and actors and all kinds of creatives. And it's not about selling. Mm. But every time I listen, there's something I pull from it that seems to make sense to me mm. about entrepreneurship. And so I think even crossing across industry yep. really serves us because it, it it, it gives us more of those fresh ideas. Mm. You know, all the more that at that time there was obviously no internet and no mobile phones. And uh, when you were, you know, away, you were really away, mm. really cut off from your family. But that was part of the, that was part of the experience. And it made me, um, it made me connect in a way, in a way, uh, more deeply with my family, because we we exchanged letters. We, there was no other way to keep in touch, you know. So we we wrote uh, letters on, on paper, and it took quite a, some time to reach me, and vice versa. And so we wrote to each other. So you know, it it takes time to. To, to reflect on a paper, it's not like sending a you know a WhatsApp. You know, it's it's not instant emotion, and I I missed uh, some of the you know big milestones in my family life. For example, my I remember my dad turned 50, and I was not here. I was in Vietnam, and they organized a big party at home, and it made me reflect on what I felt for my dad. And so I wrote him a long letter, six pages, uh, to reach him on his birthday. And in, in this letter, for the first time, I said to my dad that I loved him and that he was important for me and that, you know, uh, there were things I uh, that made that made me want to, oh, you know, uh, 
but other things that uh, just made me want to hug him and and this these are the kind of things i never used i never said to him before you know i, I kind of took him for granted him and my mom you know as long as they were here you know it was just part of a normal life but now that i was away far away uh, it made me reflect and, and and appreciate the people more and, and not just as my mom and dad but as, as people as individuals as, as, as great people and so the, the next time I, I was I returned home a few months later we hugged each other so deeply so strongly and we said to each other that we loved each other mm. I said to my dad for the first I love you and he said I love you too it was oh it was so beautiful it was and it was you know going away that made me actually come closer mm. is by giving myself time to do so and you're absolutely right we are losing the ability to think for ourselves and I noticed this you know I regularly travel down the the motorway to um, to Manchester and every time I go down there I put the sat nav on and if you ask me to drive there now without the sat nav I don't know that I could get the right junction and turn off and I do it regularly and I still rely on my sat nav. So I don't think for myself when I do that anymore. We have so many apps on our phones that tell us what we need to know. They give us, you know, that our, um, you know, mobile, uh, I, I was going to say the name of the thing that's sat in the corner of my kitchen at the moment, and I don't want to because she'll turn on and speak to me. But, you know, all we ever have to do is say, I had a builder here a couple of days ago, and uh, he was trying to work out the, the floor space that we needed for tiles. And he just said to her, so what's 1.7 times 3.4? And she gave him the answer. And I thought, you didn't even have to use maths then. You just had to ask your uh, you know, voice-controlled unit in the corner, and she gave you the answer. You don't think anymore. And so, absolutely, we don't do that thinking. So I think there's a lot of things that, not just that educational thinking where you learn, you know, and you keep remembering how to do all of those soft skill stuff, um, but also having that time, like I did the rain analogy before um, and walked through that, is just giving myself those 30 seconds that probably took me or giving myself five minutes at the end of the day or just making sure that I schedule time in my diary that is time for me to think. And that's really what I need, what you need to be able to do is whether you go out for a walk, and I do a lot of walking, whether you go out for a walk, whether you just sit quietly, whether it's on the bus on the way home, whatever it is and wherever you are, just ring, fel ring fence for yourself as often as you possibly can. Time to think. Okay, so um, coming from the head, the head or the heart, mm. using your voice, changing the pitch of your voice, the volume of your voice, mm. the uh, uh, pausing, your body language, all these things are things which you should be training. Mm. When you're doing a performance, you shouldn't be thinking about, oh, maybe I'll come from the head here, maybe I'll come from the heart. Mm. When, 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 it's like on a basketball court that you learn how to dribble, you learn how to shoot, you learn how to do these things, mm. and then you look, learn them longer, but you don't think, Oh, should I shoot now? Mm -hmm. Oh, should I now? When do I dribble? I don't know whether to dribble or to shoot. Yeah. By the time you make the decision, the time's gone. So there's a training time when you actually develop your instrument. Ah. But when you actually do it, you should have all that at your beck and call. Mm -hmm. Then you focus on your audience. Mm -hmm. It's all about your audience. And so the, I've got a technique, which is uh, how you personalize your audience as one person. Ah. How can you do that? Well, you imagine one person. And mm. so you change your uh, delivery by changing the person you're talking to. Mm. So if you're talking to a um, world leader, you will be more formal. Mm. If you're talking to a member of your family, you'll be um, more casual but really caring. If you're talking to your best friend, you'll be like really casual. Mm. So you change, you talk to one person and you change it to adapt. Mm to how you want to come across but you need but you need to be going to one person um because because you need to go from performance to conversation mm. so with performance this is what's happening in your brain mm. you're going 
um, oh, I hope it goes well, oh, I hope it goes well, oh, I hope it goes well. Then you start talking, you go, that was great, that bit was great, oh, that bit was terrible. I'm so great at this. They're going to love this, I'm blasting this. This is awful. Like, this is the worst. I'm so bored. What am I saying next? Uh, <laughs> yes. That's your headspace. But if you focus and use my technique, you're mm. talking to one person, mm. your brain is going, oh, this would be good for them. Mm. Then I'll say that. That would be helpful. Look, I think that's enough. I don't know whether I need to say any more. I think that's all they need. Mm. So in that creative space, um, would you like me to do an, um, a demonstration? Definitely, please. <laughs> okay, so this is going from performance to conversation. So if I were um, had a big group of people and I was talking about pausing, mm. okay? So if I was doing a performance, I could say, pausing is so important. When you pause, the other person has a chance to hear what you're saying. And it's really important for you because it means that you, your brain has a chance to be able to um, work itself out and you'll be uh, more, you'll be, come across more intelligent. Mm. That's a, if I'm doing a conversation, I would say, if you pause, the other person has a chance to hear what you're saying and absorb it. Mm. And you have a chance for your brain to organize all your thoughts. Mm. Um, so I read a book every week, um, a non-fiction book um, every week and it helps me to keep the open mind. So that is one thing. And I capture those books as a visual. I don't know if you've ever seen them on visualsynopsis.com. Again, I give away the posters free, the, the, the visuals um, of each book and what I thought of the book. But that keeps my mind open. The other thing is the value of questions. Mm -hmm. The value of questions. As things become more complex, the value of questions increases. Um, it's not answers that give value, it's the questions. And so I encourage my clients, um, when they're overwhelmed and they're struggling with things, write down questions. What are all the questions you have? And then look at your questions and start to see where the themes and patterns are. You, the language that you use. Um, for example, if you write lots of questions of how do I, mm. that's very action based. Um, will I is very lacking in confidence. Will mm. I, you know, should I? Mm. So look at the language that you use. But first of all, just download the questions. And I do that all the time. What are the questions? that are clogging my brain, just get them all out. Put it as a question. What is the question that I'm really asking? And usually you can simplify it down to the thing you really want to know. Mm -hmm. And it's a strategy and technique that I found really, really valuable. Value the question. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that helps me always to stay on course um, is knowing my purpose word of inspire mm. when i look at my day and i think was it successful mm. my question is have i inspired have i been inspired if the answer is yes that and it could be small mm. it could be so small um then that is success and so when i have decisions to make my, again, I come back to questions around, does this allow me to inspire or be inspired? Such a beautiful question and mission. And I love that you and your wife are pursuing this together in relationships. So love the question. My, um, What's been critical for me is giving myself permission to take the time to think. So figuring out um, and actually writing the book really, really locked this in for me, figuring out how wonderful 
the hour or the two hours is in the morning where I just say I don't take meetings. I'm not available. I haven't checked email. I'm sitting on the couch with my journal next to the puppy um, with a, a cup of coffee um, asking myself questions. And so the space and time and permission is one. The second one is the power of exploratory writing. Um, so here I'm going to recommend Allison Jones' book, Exploratory Writing. And I've, been, I've learned so much from her about all you do is set a timer for six minutes. Six minutes. We all have six minutes. No way we don't. Have, you know, everyone can find six minutes in the day, I think. Um, ask a question and her book is loaded with prompts. And then just start writing on a piece of scratch paper. It doesn't need to be, don't make it a pretty journal that makes it too precious, but just a piece of scratch paper, reflect on your, see where the pen takes you. You know, don't do it at the computer. There's something special about writing on paper and use your writing as a way to explore your thinking as opposed to using your writing as a way of documenting what you know or what you um, understand about the world, but use it as exploration. Such a powerful tool for thinking. The best way to do that is to embrace who you are as an individual. Mm. And the way you do that is by honing your own self-awareness. Leaning in to say, if I was having a conversation, say Vivian was on my team, mm. I could say to Vivian, you know, these are my top three qualities today, just today, because tomorrow's different and yesterday's gone. Mm. Today, Vivian, I think my top three heart-centered leadership qualities are that I'm trustworthy, I'm approachable, and I'm an avid reader. And then have the opportunity to say, Vivian, do you want to know the quality I'm really working on? Mastering my own character. To have the courage and the vulnerability to say, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. What do you think we should do, Vivian? Leaders aren't meant to know everything. They're not Google. They're not artificial intelligence. They're human beings. So just because someone's at the top, and they've worked their way to the top, they don't have all the answers. And I have seen some, like at a visceral level, I have seen some leaders that are so lonely at the top because they paid a price to get there, mm. whether it be their health or one or more failed marriages or a strange relationship with their children and grandchildren. And that is the biggest reason and motivator for me and it's such a blessing and I have so much fun helping these leaders kind of unpack how they got there, why they got there and what they're looking for. Much like you brought me back to when I was eight years old, mm -hmm. somewhere along their lineage of leadership, they lost their way. They lost their own dreams because they get caught into the systematic approach of leadership. And at the end of the day, yes, there's different business sectors, but we're all in the people business. Mm -hmm. And when we, and when we, and the definition of heart centered leadership is honoring your connection with people. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is being present, listening, not looking for reciprocity because it's not transactional. The only thing that should have reciprocity is listening and an exchange of soft skills. Mm. That's when you know you're fully present. Wow. Yeah, you know, um, I think there's lots of textbook definitions, but very simply in my own words, I think diversity is about being able to have varied opinions, right? So like having a large uh, range of opinions maybe at the table, mm -hmm. whereas inclusion is actually being able to bring all those opinions and to be in full voice. And a lot of my work, right, is really about not just getting now, my work in information and the work that I do in the book, mm -hmm. is not just about getting women of color promoted, but what I have found in my own research is that a lot of women of color, once they get to the seat, they're not really in full voice. They're not feeling powerful because our definition of 
leadership, our definition of what we think we need to advance mm -hmm. has been very narrowly defined. Mm -hmm. So I think my work in particular around inclusion is really, uh, inclusion and belonging is very tied together. It's about really uh, unpacking how we think of leadership. It's mm -hmm. about really making space for different kinds of leaders, because again, mm -hmm. I think we very narrowly define what the criteria is, what's important and having more varied examples that we can lead in very different ways. And we're in a moment in the world, I believe, where we need leadership to really evolve and to be different. And we need many voices and, and a lot more, um, um, not just diversity, but a lot more ability to show up in different ways at the table if we're gonna address some of the biggest problems we have on the planet. We have to get away from ageism and saying, you know, the young are indulgent and disruptive unnecessarily and have short attention spans and all those kind of lazy generalizations that the old have about the young. The young have about also the old. And I just think we need to get away with that, away from that and almost learn if we're a manager in a business or even if we're a mother to a five year old son to step out of our own time and say, okay, there's a reason why Netflix is boring to him because he was born with it. It's almost has, does not have the same allure to my son that it has to me because he's just used to it. And actually trying to understand that and learn and empathize with different generations because of that, I think is incredibly important thing to do in society. Whether it's looking at a baby boomer or someone in their 60s and 70s and realizing that in Vietnam, or they went through a certain period in your nation's history, through war, through dis political disruption, through revolution and upheaval, and how that has shaped that generation, those in their 60s and 70s now and helping the young people, the 9X generation in Vietnam, to understand what that was like and to understand what that meant for not your country, but actually just at people's everyday lives. And that's what I mean by we have to transcend our time because actually what that is, is about creating empathy, understanding and bringing the generations together. And it's as important in the workplace as it is in the family. I like to read a lot mm. and when I read when I read it spurs new ideas um, so that's one way and the other way I like to put my phone down and if I'm just if I'm going for a walk um, I often like I sometimes I'll listen to a podcast but I find some of my better thinking is if I go for a walk on the beach and I just let my mind wander it I get ideas from doing so you know um, so definitely reading reading and podcasts but also then just letting my putting devices away and just just kind of walking and being in nature i, I find great ideas come to me beautiful beautiful and sometimes not so good ideas too by the way like <laughs> <laughs> lots of ideas thank you for sharing Well, I have to say that I'm grateful for my cultural background because one of the things that I was taught very young, um, a part of um, a Jewish tradition is that we question everything. You know, now I drove my teachers crazy. They hated me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always had to sit in the corner because I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe there's another way to look at this, you know, and they were the experts, so they didn't like my questioning. But I, I, you know, it's a part of my, I mean, we had a value of, of learning and going to school and always questioning, always questioning, is this truth or not? Is there another thing that we've understood? So maybe the truth has changed. So I think that always questioning what's missing. If somebody were to argue with me, what would they say? You know, if I were wrong, <laughs> what would I be wrong about? You know, so I question, I, it's the questioning mm. that um, helps me to learn. 
you know, not just, you know, the reading of books. And because a lot of times when you read or you read articles or social media, you're just looking to confirm what you know, mm. you know, so I, I mean, and that's what coaches do. I just rupt your thinking. So, you know, it's going to be a little uncomfortable in my coaching. My uh, third book was The Discomfort Zone. Mm. And I wrote that for leaders, you know, like discomfort is a part of learning. That means we're letting go of what we knew and that's uncomfortable. The brain doesn't like that, you know, and to open to what else is possible. So um, I help other people to I disrupt their thinking and make them a little uncomfortable to open them up. But again, it's what I had learned, you know, that maybe I don't know um, what's the right way mm. and to, to question, question, question. So I think it, that's how we expand our learning yeah. is to say, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. You know, and take in other ways of seeing things. And then you can go back to your own way, but at least question. Yeah. Question it. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's this, I think it's an example of what I noticed that was part of what it is that I wanted to write about in the widest net, my natural inclination with a lens on whatever is that part of my body of work that I'm building. So like in the days when I was doing Escape from Cubicle Nation, I'm, I'm always on the search for people who are the smartest, most interesting, that are doing like have really deep experts that have interesting tools that I can be bringing to my, my clients or my audience, my readers. And through that pursuit, there really is this for me, it's a, it's a natural interest of like being drawn to the work. Guy Kawasaki is another person who I've known for so many years. Who I'm pretty proud now, to, you know, to call a friend, but with somebody who I still just admire so greatly for what he does. But like in the early days, my, my driving force was not, oh my gosh, he's famous. I should connect with him so that it opens up opportunities. It was that I love the way that he's talking about branding that's so interesting it makes me want to know him more mm. and so that's the way always that my connection with people starts out mm. and a lot of what I talk about in the widest net the process that you have for taking the time to respectfully get to know somebody the first time I met Dan I loved his books from early on. Free Agent Nation in the early days was so inspirational. Work he did in the magazine Fast Company just felt revolutionary to me early on. And so I followed his work for a long time. I think there was a first time I might have met him at a live event and like everybody else, I stood in a long line and then I went and I, when I was able to shake his hand, I shook his hand, smiled, you know, probably took a picture, you know, had him sign a book. But that was an example of a first point of connection. And then maybe a little bit later, I would put comments on something that he put on social media. And then, you know, later, maybe there was somebody I knew who knew him, or I might, you know, reach out through his website and send a message with some encouraging information. What's so, what one of the things I've learned when people are famous often for a reason, because they have an amazing body of work, but they also have many people coming at them mm. is actually something that Guy Kawasaki shared. We, we had, he had been instrumental in really opening up my audience mm. for my blog and escape from cubicle nation. Um, and I had written a post that I thought he might like, I didn't know him at all. I reached out to send him an email one night just saying, I love your work. I thought you might like this. He ended up sharing that the next day on his blog and it wow. went tremendously viral. And so, we had fun through the week after that, like emailing and I was telling him what was going on. And it was just, that was kind of a fun point of connection. Eventually through really maybe about 18 months after that is when I ended up getting a book deal for the book Escape from Cubicle Nation. So he and I were on a panel together at a conference at South by Southwest, which is in, in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And so he said the question of how do you get, how do you catch the eye of somebody who's really an influencer? Mm -hmm. And he said, sometimes people think that I have the Midas touch because everything I touch turns to gold. He said, they have it wrong. I only touch gold. And so what, what it meant for me and what I really keep in mind and as 
I, through the years, have gotten a bigger audience. And so in some cases, there could be somebody trying to make a connection with me where I have many people coming. Is It is nothing to do with how long you've been in business or how many followers you have, where you are sincerely contributing something of value to your field, to the ecosystem, to your clients. By definition, your right partners, those that are also equals or just much more experienced equals, can be interested in your work when they really learn what it is that you're working on. Mm -hmm. And that is the point of connection because otherwise it's just gonna be a very unequal thing where you're, you don't feel good as the person saying, please famous influencer, would you build a relationship with me so it will build my platform? I mean, like that doesn't feel good to them, it doesn't feel good to you. Mm -hmm. But if you see throughout the years that you're consistently working on things that are complementary mm -hmm. and that you're you know, generous with them whenever Guy has a book coming out or Dan, I love their work. When I love the work and it connects with my audience, I will share about it, I will write about it because we're each contributing something important to the field. And so that's probably the biggest thing I think for people is to really take your time and have patience mm -hmm. um, but also to not hesitate to really be asking for sometimes like connections like I had for Guy Kawasaki mm. or my current really the last 15 years I always talk about John Legend the singer I love John Legend I love his work I always talk about him and little by little I've been getting closer and closer through to his team and to you know some potential ways to, to maybe finally connect and what would be lovely was you know would be eventually to do some work together wow. but have patience with the process and I think balance being very clear with who you're excited about and who you think is amazing but to make sure that it's not just because they're famous mm. or that they can do something for you that that's an example of that very transactional way of looking at something mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel good for the person you're reaching out to mm. and it is not empowering for you as well wow. So I think it's really important that we're very deliberate in what we do. And what I mean by that is sometimes we can be very complacent and you do the same thing over and over, but you're not really growing and developing and challenging yourself. I mean, and that is, you know, it would have been easy to stay at Space Foundation and just keep doing the same old thing. And but. I think we, as human beings, just like you, you've challenged yourself by creating this podcast, by meeting new people, by learning new things. So I think what we all need to do as humanity is to continue to challenge ourselves, to continue to grow and learn, because think about what's on the horizon, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is gonna change everything. It's gonna change how we do things. It's gonna change jobs. It's gonna eliminate jobs. It's gonna create new jobs. It's gonna change you know, I always, I now have AI uh, that I'm using in my new company, SB Global, that's helping me take notes and synthesize my notes for my book and everything. So we have to continue to grow and learn. We have to continue to challenge ourselves. We can't get complacent because I think when you get complacent, that's when your your brain stops thinking. And your brain, it, it's not a muscle, but it's like a muscle. It has to be used. It has to be challenged. And that is one way to do it. And I think you've demonstrated how you've challenged your brain by doing all these interviews. Mm, great question um, and great mission. You know, I'm with you on that mission. If I think we can, if we can get other people to think, uh, we will be able to change. We will be able to change the world for sure. So for me personally, what has helped me to just widen my thinking, I'd say, is um, I, like I meditate. So I practice, I practice yoga and meditation. And it doesn't mean like I'm only practicing it on the mat or I'm only practicing when I'm sitting quiet. When you are, um, when we talk about yoga and meditation, it's actually something you do throughout your life. It's a lifestyle. So it's not just, you know, the the one hour that you spend on the mat and the one hour that you spend with yourself, but how do you carry it throughout your the day, throughout your life in all your interactions? So for me, what has helped is sort of sitting with myself, um, becoming more aware of my own thoughts, my own, um, 
you know, preferences, my own uh, discomfort, things like that, uh, being open to the understanding, being open to the challenges. Also, when I meet others who have differing views, being open to that, because those are places where you have a lot of growing to do. So in the past, uh, I'd say, you know, sometimes if I didn't agree with someone or I didn't like what they, they were saying, I just, you know, not be interested and kind of cut, you know, cut it off there. But now I'll, I'll probe further because, my, because I'm curious to understand their way of thinking. And I've learned that, you know, once you allow your mind to explore that, it gives you a whole different perspective because the way you're thinking is shaped by your perspective. And once you're able to put a different lens on, it changes the way you look at everything, the situation, the question you're dealing with, the challenge, um, everything from there. You know, um, there's a term called Maya. Have you, are you familiar with the term Maya? No. No. So Maya comes from the Sanskrit language and it, um, it actually refers to the world being an illusion. So the way we look at our reality is our reality. It's not, it's not everybody's reality. It's just the way we see it. It's our perception. So everyone comes with their own perception, their own reality. So when, if somebody wants to stretch their thinking, which is, you know, a fabulous way to grow, it's just allowing yourself to see a different reality to open your mind to a different perspective, do things that are new, that are uncomfortable, so you can grow, meet others who are not like you, so you can grow. So that's that's helped me. And I would say, you know, once, you, once you're open to that, the learning is limitless. Wow. I think it's, it's a lifelong journey. Mm. I, I can't say I know fully who I am today. I think I hope and I pray that today I'm a better version of myself than 14 years ago when I started my journey. Uh -huh. And I hope that I will continue this journey, you know, until, you know, I leave the earth. Right. So, so I think that the idea is to continue the journey. So embarking on it is a process. It's a journey. And so if you think of it as a destination, um, then you will fail because once you get there, then what? Then you get there, then what, right? So I think uh, the idea of understanding it's a process and a journey is really important. And then you can, anyone can start today. You don't have to wait until you have all these achievements <laughs> or all these things done. You can start today. And starting today is knowing who you asking yourself questions about your purpose, mm -hmm. why you do what you do, who do you want to be? What are your values? So those are the questions that I, I started to grapple with and not in a superficial way, not in a, oh, my values are collaboration because together everyone is better. I mean, these are like um, values that we talk about in society, but many of us don't practice and live. Mm -hmm. So it's really about being super honest with yourself and then getting people around you. The people around you know you really well. Yep. They, they will be very, very honest mirrors to you. And they will tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly if you are willing and have the humility to listen to the ugly. Mm 